The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash RGT 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Thank you for listening to Peerview Podcasts. We greatly appreciate your support and would like to hear from you. Can we ask for a favor? Participate today in a short one-minute survey at www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to share how podcasts play a role in your medical education routine. Again, that's www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to participate. And now on to today's podcast. Hello, I'm Dr. Sheldon Rich, a pharmacist and president of SJR Associates, which is a healthcare consulting company located in Sarasota, Florida. I'm also an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Michigan. Welcome to this virtual symposium titled Cannabinol in the Treatment of Arsenal for Severe Epilepsy Syndromes, Practical Guidance for Managed Care Professionals. Joining me, and I'm happy to have him today, is Dr. Oren Davinsky, who's director of the NYU Epilepsy Center and a professor of neurology, neuroscience, neurosurgery, and psychiatry at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine in New York. Welcome, Oren. Thank you. Happy to be here. So with that, let me go ahead and get us started. So the first question that always comes up is, why cannabis for seizures? So this story um, that I'm going to share with you is the first American story of a child that uh, was able to get access to using CBD um, for, uh, for epilepsy. And as I've talked to Dr. Davinsky about this, he tells me he's got a myriad of additional patients that could share a very similar story. But it's very interesting to kind of go back into history here. This was a story of Evelyn, a mother who was very desperate to help her son, Sam, who was uh, having a significant amount of uh, seizures. So his seizure started in 2005 at four years of age. She, um, he had the first seizure, two months passed before he had another, but eventually he was having 100 seizures a day. Um, at worst, he was having one about every three minutes. So he went in, he was diagnosed, he had epilepsy, they diagnosed him as epilepsy with uh, myoclonic absences, abrupt unresponsiveness and sudden body jerks. They tried numerous medications for him, some helped briefly, others caused some significant side effects for him. So his mom interestingly described his life as a bad cell phone connection. Every few minutes or so, the signal dropped off. I won't get into cell phone companies, but who, some of you that have those particular companies know what I'm talking about. So he, uh, his mom in 2011 had read a study in the British Medical Journal about a small CBD study in rats. Uh, CBD at that point was not available or not really easy to obtain. Um, his mom joined this underground epilepsy collective and they had their own herbalist and they were cooking up their own CBD. But there was a lot of lot to lot variation and they tended to have fairly poor results with that. She learned about a uh, British pharmaceutical company, Greenwich uh, Pharmaceuticals, that was uh, developing a highly concentrated CBD, and they were used, originally were looking at that for MS spasticity. So she went through all the protocols that she needed to and finally was able to get permission to get him enrolled in a, the clinical trial at that point in time and flew to London after she obtained uh, that permission. After he was given his first day, his seizures were down to 30. After two days, they were down to 10. And after three days, they were down to one. So now the issue became, what is he going to do now? The product seemed to be working for him. So he ended up coming back to the United States and needed to find a way to keep getting the drug. So he found a very compassionate neurologist at the University of California, San Francisco, by the name of Roberta Cilio. She agreed to enroll Sam in a one-person trial. Um, at that point in time, understanding this was a Schedule I controlled substance, uh, she was required to buy a, a large, uh, unmovable safe to store the product in. And uh, she ultimately uh, was able to work through all the logistics of that. Sam became the first person in the world to receive purified CBD, which was later named Epidiolex. Probably a good point for me to mention at, uh, at this time, uh, when we're speaking of the FDA-approved CBD product, we're going to call it by its brand name of Epidiolex because it will cause a lot of confusion, which I'm going to 
go through in a few slides here. So if we're referring to the approved agent, it's going to be Epidiolex. If we're talking about unapproved agents uh, in the CBD category, we'll probably just refer to them as CBD. First study of uh, Epidiolex was uh, published in 2015, 214 patients. They showed efficacy in about a third of those patients. And then, as I mentioned, there's numerous other stories uh, that are out there. And Dr. Davinsky certainly is, uh, has shared a few of those with me and, and uh, sees these patients all the time. So I want to briefly go into this understanding production regulation of medical marijuana, hemp, THC, and uh, cannabidiol, because it's getting, it's very, very confusing. And we always have a lot of questions at these seminars about what the differences are and such. So I want to briefly go through that and hope that I can make some sense of that. So cannabis is a naturally growing, growing plant. It contains over 400 different cannabinoid compounds. Uh, 100 cannabinoids have been isolated. And um, we find that mostly in the flowering tops, the buds, the top leaves, the lower leaves, stems, and stalks of the plant. And uh, some people may have heard of indica or sativa. They've been crossbred now. So really, if somebody says, oh, I have a indica-based or sativa-based cannabis, it really, at this point in time, probably is not. It's been so crossbred that it probably doesn't maintain its, its uh, specific characteristics. Okay, so let's talk about cannabis. Cannabis uh, is made up of predominantly Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, which is the euphoric compound. When people think of cannabis and they're giving them a high, that's what's causing that is THC. It's predominantly used recreationally. And then we have uh, cannabidiol, which is a non-euphoric compound. It's predominantly used medicinally. So these are the two main components of cannabis. So the THC component that causes the predominant high is a partial CB1 agonist. It's helpful in preventing and has been found and some medications are available with THC to prevent nausea and vomiting because of cancer chemotherapy, uh, can promote appetite. Uh, people that have used uh, cannabis in the past say, oh gee, I just start eating like crazy when I'm using it. And uh, there are some medical conditions that it has beneficial effects for. Unfortunately, there's a number of adverse effects. Uh, short term, we could have memory loss, uh, impaired coordination, altered thinking, panic, et cetera. You can see those things on the slide for yourself. And long term, there is a 9% or so addiction rate that varies based on which study you look at, potentially altered brain development, uh, diminished life satisfaction, cognitive impairment, those type of things, lower IQ. So there are some concerns here with Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, and um, that is something that we certainly uh, need to keep an eye on. Now for uh, can cannabidiol, it's the, non uh, the major non-euphoric component of cannabis, so you don't get a high from that. We don't know exactly how that uh, works. It may be an antagonist, but we're not exactly positive. There's a lot of studies being done to try and prove that. It doesn't have any adverse neurological effects, no effects on vital sign or mood, and it does enhance the activity of our endogenous uh, cannabidiol. The um, adverse effects, and we'll talk about that when we start talking about the approved product, um, but you also need to be aware of these because based on some products, CBD that's available without a prescription, if patients use that, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, somnolence, decreased appetite, diarrhea, fatigue, and it may increase the risk of infection. So this is a very interesting story. So the FDA does not, um, other than the Epidiolex product, does not have any approvals of any other products today. But the agriculture, um, Department of Agriculture, came up with a hemp regulation. And a lot of people say, well, how can you have CBD available over the counter? How can you sell it? Because it's still, as I will talk about later, a class one drug um, from the DEA, but the industrialized hemp or through the Agriculture Commission, allowed registered industrial hemp farmers within the USDA. So as long as the THC concentration is less than 0.3%, hemp can be grown, and that's why CBD, over-the-counter, I'll call it for lack of saying, non-prescription CBD, 
can be sold and is available. That does not mean that you're immune from potentially getting arrested for having that product, although the government typically has been looking the other way with that. The other thing to note is marijuana must be grown inside with regulated light, temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, oxygen levels to maximize the THC concentration. Um, and then hemp must be grown outdoors to maximize the size and yield. Uh, less attention is paid to the individual plants, more so to the yield. So there's some federal and state considerations here. Currently, I believe it's now 34 states. Another state was added a few weeks ago. Uh, and I don't know which one that was, but it's tough to keep uh, track of, of all the different state changes here. But 33, I'll say 34 states in Washington, D.C. have legalized medical marijuana in some restricted quantity. Um, some have CBD-specific regulations, but not too terribly many. The Farm Bill, which was the bill that allowed industrialized hemp in 2018, legalized, once again, the cultivation of hemp that is less than 0.3% THC, it's a state and federal regulatory process. The states have to submit their plans to the United States uh, Department of Agriculture for, Agriculture for approval. And um, it uh, did remove some of these products uh, from C1 status if it's produced under state and federal laws related to hemp. Not, not uh, cannabis, but for hemp. So it's about as clear as mud, but I wanted to make sure I brought this up because it's very, very confusing to folks. So this is the legal status of cannabis in the United States. 33, now 34, legal medical marijuana states in Washington, D.C. Uh, there's 10 legal recreational marijuana states and Washington, D.C. A number of states have various approved medical conditions where you can use medical cannabis, and they're listed on this slide. So a lot of different things are called out. You'll see that it's uh, about clear as mud because there's not consistency from one state to the next, and there is no federal guideline for this. And these are the different approved medical conditions that different states look for, um, based uh, ranking based on the number of states approved. So for cancer, um, there's really not enough evidence here showing any anti-tumor anti effects. Uh, there's one pilot with two patients. It's preclinical. Um, we don't think that the indication is appropriate at this point in time because there's not enough medical scrutiny that's going, gone into that. Uh, we have seizures. This is for, once again, medical marijuana, not for the approved FDA-approved product, Epidiolex. Um, and you can see here, for muscle spasticity, um, it is appropriate. It does improve mobility, perceptions of spasticity, pain. Uh, I'll just really go to the yes column here. For pain, there is some data there that it does help in, uh, with pain. For nausea, we've seen some, moder or some large randomized clinical trials where it is effective for nausea. And on this slide, we don't really see any of these listed, and that's why you have less medical conditions uh, listed on this slide. So it's been tried for a lot of different things. So the current legislation, though, is relatively misleading. Uh, cannabis may allevi alleviate symptoms, but it's not actually being used to treat the disease itself. So for MS, cancer, HIV, hepatitis C, Crohn's, Alzheimer's, et cetera, um, it, it may release some symptoms, but it's not curative of that disease. And I think our patients don't really unnecessarily always understand that difference. So it's very, very confusing to them. So hopefully with that, you have an idea of why CBD non-prescription products are available. It's because of the, the 2018 hemp bill through the Department of Agriculture, not through the FDA. And then the CBD product, Epidiolex, has gone through FDA approval process and is FDA approved. There's some recent changes to its uh, F uh, DEA status and such, which I'll talk about after Davins Dr. Davinsky's talk and, uh, and kind of go through that for you as well. So with that, Oren, let me turn it over to you and uh, we'll go through uh, Masterclass One. Thank you so much, Sheldon. So I'll be going over the current challenges and practical considerations in using Epidiolex specifically, but cannabidiol, uh, which is the major ingredient in Epidiolex, in treating treatment-resistant epilepsies. So to begin with, when we consider children and young adults with developmental disabilities due to severe pediatric epilepsies, we need to think about what's the underlying cause for why these individuals have the cognitive and behavioral deficits as well as seizures. 
And so in part, specifically on the cognitive and behavioral disorders, uh, there's some underlying disorders. For many of them, for example, with Dravet syndrome, 85% will have a sodium channel gene mutation. Um, there are many other mutations that can be involved with epilepsy. This leads to physiologic dysfunction. Sodium channels are not working normally in their nerve cells, um, and so it disrupts the connections between cells. Other individuals may have structural abnormalities where brain formation was not normal or there was an injury after birth. Then there is, as you can see on the bottom part of the slide on the right, interictal epilepsy wave or epileptiform activity, which we know can affect attention, memory, concentration. Uh, if these waves occur during non-REM sleep, that's where we consolidate short-term memory, uh, and that'll disrupt that. This is one of the reasons why college students who do all-nighters don't tend to do too well, because whatever they learn, they can't retain. And then there's the seizure activity itself, uh, intermittent epileptiform discharges, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, two minutes, uh, even without an overt seizure, can again impair brain function. And then, of course, there are more severe seizures with convulsive activity. Um, those can be akin to concussions, essentially. They're not good for the brain. In addition, sometimes people fall during these seizures and do sustain significant head trauma, often beyond a simple concussion. Some seizures go on for very prolonged periods of time, and their status epilepticus, which are the most dangerous, life-threatening, and brain injurious type of seizures. And then, of course, the medications we use to treat epilepsy and seizures often have significant cognitive and behavioral side effects, depending on the specific medication. Dravet syndrome is a rare, catastrophic, lifelong epilepsy that typically begins in the first year of life, but always begins before age 18 months of age. And these children suffer frequent and prolonged seizures. The clinical criteria to diagnose Dravet syndrome are shown below. Uh, and usually four of the criteria on the top or more, normal or near normal cognitive and motor development before the onset of seizures, two or more seizures with or without fever before age one year of age, myoclonic, hemiclonic, or generalized tonic-clonic seizures, two or more seizures lasting more than 10 minutes, and a failure to respond to multiple first-line anti-seizure medications with seizures persisting after age two years of age. And then other features that we see in many of these children, uh, seizures may follow vaccinations when there's fever and malaise, and the seizures can be provoked by elevated body temperature, whether it's from a hot bath or from exercising outdoors or being outside on a very hot summer day. There's often developmental slowing or stagnation or even regression after the first year of life. There can be behavioral problems, speech delay, unsteadiness or ataxia of gait, typically developing in adolescence and then also tremor, which can be made worse by medications, but can occur as a primary feature of the disorder as well. The incidence is estimated to be about 1 in 15,700 live births in the United States. Um, so it's a rare epilepsy, but when it occurs, they're pretty severe, and so it actually represents a fair portion of a pediatric epilepsy practice. Roughly 85% of the children with Dravet will have a mutation. Typically, it's a de novo or new mutation, not present in either parent, in the SCN1A gene, which codes for the NAV1.1 component of the most abundant sodium channel in brain nerve cells. Clinically, Dravet syndrome is about 0.17% of all epilepsies treated uh, among children and adults. The seizures are drug resistant uh, less frequently um, after puberty. So that is after puberty, many of these children, the seizures come under much better control, but especially the first five or seven years of life, seizures can be really, really disabling and frequent despite our best attempts to treat them and control them. As I said, cognitive delays are common, essentially 95% have an intellectual disability and 25% will meet criteria for an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. Gait disorder usually occurs after puberty, so by adolescence, these children often show abnormalities in their walking, uh, 
and there's very sadly a high mortality rate. About 15% will die by adolescence and 20% will die by early adulthood. And the vast majority of these die from seizures, either SUDEP, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, or from status epilepticus, less frequently drowning and pneumonia. So here's a patient uh, who I saw uh, before I knew what Dravet syndrome was. I first saw him in 1992. He was born a healthy boy until age four months. And nine hours after his first DPT vaccination, he had a 90-minute tonic-clonic seizure. Uh, and then when initially evaluated uh, in that seizure as well, there was a right focal clonic onset to the seizure. His MRI and his EEG were normal. And this is a picture of him a little later in life but in early childhood, and subsequently he had focal and generalized seizures with fever at age six months of age, and then seizures without fever beginning at nine months of age, and eventually got referred to me early on by age two for evaluation and made some med changes and suggestions, and he returned to his primary care pediatric neurologist, um, who eventually put him on 11 different anti-seizure meds, vagus nerve stimulator, uh, and all of these failed to control seizures. He reemerged in my practice at age 20 after a gap of well over 15 years uh, because the neurologist had thrown up his hands and he's still having seizures. Uh, this is a picture of him uh, at about that age. And he you know, was having just one big breakthrough every three to six months, but he couldn't drive. He was actually fairly on the high intellectual spectrum for Dravet syndrome. He also had minor seizures, which were diagnosed as focal unaware seizures. And as soon as I saw him again for the second time and went through the history with Alex and his mom, uh, it became clear about the febrile seizures, the seizures occurring after vaccination, the prolonged seizures early in life with hemiclonic. He was really right out of the textbook of Dravet syndrome. And I said, we need to get an epilepsy panel and see if he has an SCN1A mutation. And quite sadly, I got the result back at night. The next morning I saw it on my pile. Um, there it was. He had a de novo truncating, a severe mutation in this gene. And I literally called the mom to say, and they were coming in uh, the next day for an admission to evaluate for possible surgery. And I called to let her know we have an answer. And she said he had just passed away in his sleep that night. So literally the, the night that I got his diagnosis and the next morning when I saw it, he died during that interval. Um, a classic suit up. He was found dead in bed, face down. And uh, that was it. His life was gone. And, and so even though he was on the milder side, um, seizure every three to six months, uh, it's still even infrequent seizures, whether it's Dravet syndrome or anyone with epilepsy, sadly, can cause a sudden death. So for individuals with SCN1A mutations, there's clearly a wide spectrum of affectation or, or how the disease manifests itself, the gene disorder. It can be, number one, it can be asymptomatic. It can cause just migraines, familial hemiplegic migraines. Some individuals only have febrile seizures. Some have febrile seizures with some additional non-febrile seizures called febrile seizures plus. One of those categories is with generalized convulsive seizures with febrile seizures, and that's called GEFs plus. Another one is intractable childhood epilepsy with generalized tonic-clonic seizures. And then in the most severe manifestation, it's Dravet syndrome. Sometimes, uh, most frequently, it's the type of mutation in SCN1A. But keep in mind, we have 20,000 other genes. Most of them are expressed in the brain, and many do affect seizure threshold. And then for every gene, there are many, many promoters and regulatory elements that allow genes to be turned on, turned up, turned down, turned off. Uh, and so mutations or abnormalities and variants in those other genes and regulatory elements and promoters can greatly influence how another gene manifests itself. The second disorder for which epidiolex, cannabidiol, was assessed to treat epilepsy is Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. And this is a criteria to diagnose Lennox-Gastaut syndrome based on some expert panel reviews. But the major criteria are more than two seizure types. Um, typically, one of those should be a tonic seizure, seizure onset before age 12 years, a history of EEG with generalized slow spike in wave discharges, which I will show you on the next slide, and cognitive impairment since childhood. 
Minor criteria include persistent seizures despite the use of two or more anti-seizure medications, history of vagus nerve stimulation, ketogenic diet, or epilepsy surgery, other EEG abnormalities, multifocal spikes, generalized discharges, paroxysmal fast activity, and evidence of seizure-related uh, helmet use or head or face injuries, which are sadly you know, very common in these children and young adults. So typically to diagnosis, there are three major and two to three minor. Um, and then for the non-LGS drug-resistant epilepsy, they tend to have one or less of the major and only one or two of the minor criteria. And the next slide shows two patterns. On the top is the classic slow spike in wave. Just discharges, these are generalized, they're widespread in the brain, but unlike the more typical generalized spike in wave pattern that are seen in children and adults with idiopathic generalized epilepsy, those discharges occur at a frequency of three to five hertz or cycles per second whereas the slow spike in wave discharge is less than 3 hertz, typically in the 1.5 to 2.5 hertz frequency range. And on the bottom of this slide, you see a discharge called a generalized paroxysmal fast activity, GFPA. And this is another hallmark EEG signature together with the slow spike in wave discharge of Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. And then the final disorder or syndrome for which epidiolex cannabidiol has been assessed and approved by the FDA to treat epilepsy in these children and adults is tuberous sclerosis complex. There are more than two children born each day with TSC. It affects about 6,000 live births, 1 million people worldwide, 50,000 in the United States, and many of them are undiagnosed because of the relative obscurity of the disease, especially when it has a mild clinical presentation. So here's a disorder where you can have people who have PhDs and you can have people who are nonverbal. So a very wide spectrum of how it affects people. Here are some of the major features. Uh, facial angiofibromas, which is shown on the face on the top right there, uh, or forehead plaques, non-traumatic ungual or periungual, those are the fingernail fibromas, hypomelanotic macules or white spots, typically more than three, a chagrin patch, which is typically uh, found in the lower back. It's a connective tissue nevus. It's raised and, and slightly, um, you can feel it uh, and, the, and the parents are often aware of it. There can be multiple retinal nodular hamartomas seen on ophthalmological evaluation. Uh, these are benign and rarely cause problems, but they're helpful for diagnosis. Cortical tubers are seen on MRI scans, and I should say the bottom right photo there is a chagrin patch from uh, the back of a patient. Cortical tubers are present in the brain. Uh, these are thought to be contributory factors to the development of epilepsy and also uh, cognitive and behavioral issues. Subependymal nodules are benign things that line the ventricles. They're little growths. Subependymal giant cell astrocytomas are often found in the region of the foramen magnum, and these are subependymal nodules that continue to grow and become benign tumors, and they can be quite dangerous if they obstruct the flow of cerebral spinal fluid. That can lead to elevated intracranial pressure and even herniation and death. So we typically have to monitor those with serial MRI scans, depending on how big they are and how old the child, young adult is, uh, but probably at least every year, typically they're monitored. Cardiac rhabdomyomas are benign tumors of the heart. They're most often identified actually in utero on ultrasounds or in the first year of life, and then they often regress on their own. Lymphangiomyelomatosis, or LAM, is a conversion uh, typically from renal angiomyelopomas, which are in the kidneys that may spread through the lymph ducts to the lungs. And these are, the LAM are relatively serious manifestations and can unfortunately be deadly, and these are much more common in women. So certainly for any older girl or woman with tuberous sclerosis who has renal angiomyelipomas, AMLs, we tend to start doing chest CTs to look for LAM, and if it's present, um, treat it potentially with an mTOR inhibitor and monitor it closely.
But what are the neurologic features? Seizures occur in more than 80% of these patients. They often begin before age one. Uh, and infantile spasms often between ages four to six months, but can occur at any time before age two. And Vigabitrin is a particularly effective medication for infantile spasms in these children. Intellectual disability affects more than 40% of children with TSC, autism more than 25%, and then many other psychiatric comorbidities like ADHD, OCD, aggression, irritability, anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances, bipolar disorder, psychosis, and others. So this is a very serious disorder with many physical features, usually due to tissue overgrowth and benign tumors, although rarely malignant tumors occur as well. Um, but the brain manifestations are typically the most disabling. This is a slide that I think is incredibly informative about epilepsy in general and the toll that seizures play on young children. This is a slide taken from Manny Gomez's book, uh, written in 1979, his experience at the Mayo Clinic. He was one of the nation's leading experts in TS. And if you look at those children with TS whose seizures began before age one, 72 out of 79 had intellectual disability, essentially 90%. If you look at those who had seizures begin after age 15 years, it was about 15% had intellectual disability. And if you look at those with no epilepsy, there were none with intellectual disability. And so what I think this speaks to is the earlier the brain is assaulted by epilepsy, the more severe the assault, the greater the chance there will be a severe intellectual problem going forward. And then this is a story of a child that's a good story with TSE. Um, 1995, I was early into my practice, a boy who was in the town I was living in, I got called to see in the hospital. He had the onset of infantile spasms. An MRI revealed cortical tubers, so he was diagnosed with tuber sclerosis. We had heard that Vigabitrin was very effective in patients in Europe with this disorder. It was not approved yet by the FDA. We were able to get the drug. Uh, he became seizure-free within several days. He remained on that drug and was later changed to more standard medications with very infrequent uh, focal-aware seizures, minor seizures, uh, and he subsequently was able to go to the University of Michigan and graduate. Um, this is a child, if he was born in Manny Gomez's era, and the, nothing against Dr. Gomez, um, but the drugs weren't available then. He would have been treated with phenobarbital and dilantin, and he would have been severely intellectually disabled. Uh, now he's a bright young man, working independent, great college, and uh, a real success story. And I think an example of where effective seizure control can make a world of difference for these individuals. So just briefly, this partly goes over Dr. Rich's comments, but the biology of cannabis, there are two main species, sativa and indica, and between them, there are more than 500 compounds, including other cannabinoids, in addition to CBD and THC, terpenes and flavonoids. These other compounds, we know many of them, but they've not been studied uh, by science and medicine to nearly the degree that CBD and THC have. CBD Dr. Rich said, it's not psychoactive. It binds to many receptors. The ones I'll just focus on relevant here are the GPR55 receptor, which is what we think may be the most important one for seizures, uh, the TRPV receptors, which are probably important for pain, serotonin receptors, probably important for the anti-anxiety properties observed in some animal models and human studies, and then multiple, multiple anti-inflammatory effects. By contrast, CBD, uh, I'm sorry, THC is psychoactive. It stimulates the CB1 receptor in the brain. It also stimulates the CB2 receptor, which is mainly in immune cells outside of the brain. Um, so they're really very, very different compounds. Um, their mechanisms of action are quite different, uh, as is their potential for addiction, which exists with THC, um, and dependence, which does not exist with CBD. So this slide, uh, you can take time to digest it, but it really just gives you an idea of how diverse the mechanisms are of CBDs, cannabidiols, anti-inflammatory effects. Just look at point number three. Look at how many of the interleukins, uh, 1 beta, 3, 6, 12, 17, TNF alpha, INF beta alpha, gamma, um, just huge numbers of effects. It's really quite remarkable that one molecule 
can exert literally more than 20 different anti-inflammatory effects. So, you know, this may contribute to some of CBD's anti-seizure properties and anti-epilepsy uh, potentially properties. Uh, this is under investigation. Certainly the GPR55 receptor uh, clearly is implicated in excitability in the nervous system as well. Cannabinoids for epilepsy, the preclinical data summarized here. So this looks across a number of different, mostly mice and rat studies uh, that looked in different experimental models of epilepsy, like maximal electroshock, pentylene tetrazole, bicuculane, a lot of different models exist. This just puts them all together and summarizes it. And I'm going to focus on two of the rightmost bars in this histogram. So the second from the far right is delta-9 THC. And you can see in most of the models that green component is that THC usually exerts anti-convulsant uh, or anti-seizure properties. It is rarely pro-convulsant and about 25-30% of the time doesn't have an effect on the seizure threshold. By contrast, CBD, the far right bar together with CBDV, which is a very closely related uh, cannabinoid, those have about a 75 to 80 percent reduction in different animal models will reduce seizure activity. Um, in the remainder of models, they have no effect, but in no models do they make seizures worse. So CBD from the preclinical animal model data has always been very strong and very supportive that it would work. And in work done in two labs, one by Salantav, uh, and then more recently by Evan Rosenberg and Dick Chen at NYU, who I've collaborated with, we've looked at the effect of CBD on an existing pathway in the brain. So there is a lipid called LPI, which stimulates the GPR55 receptor. And what Salantev and his group showed is that when LPI stimulates the GPR55 receptor on pyramidal excitatory cells that are glutaminergic, it increases excitation uh, through presynaptic calcium release, uh, mini excitatory presynaptic uh, potentials, and also the amplitude of those. So it has multiple effects on excitation. And what we at the NYU group did, led by Evan Rosenberg and Dick Chen, found that when the GPR55 receptor is stimulated by LPI on inhibitory GABAnergic interneurons, it decreases inhibition through the mechanism shown on the slide. And it is the perfect disaster for a seizure because it increases excitation, it decreases inhibition, it moves the ratio of E to I, excitation to inhibition, dramatically towards seizure activity. And so it drives a seizure and then it's a terrible positive feedback loop because when a seizure occurs, the nerve cells make more GPR55 receptors, making them even more sensitive to the excitatory effects of LPI. And CBD blocks the effect of LPI on both excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. So CBD really breaks this positive feedback loop in a nice way. Just touching briefly on the pharmacology of Epidiolex, it's important to know that all the cannabinoids are fat-soluble compounds. Uh, it's true for CBD, THC, and most of the other ones in cannabis. And because they're fat-soluble, their oral, oral absorption is poor. Uh, if they're taken on an empty stomach, an individual may absorb only 4 to 5%. If they're taken after a high-fat meal, like a ribeye steak or a big bowl of guacamole and chips, uh, you will absorb 16 to 20% of the CBD. So literally a four to five fold increase in absorption if it's consumed after or with a high fat meal. It is also significantly metabolized in the liver. And you can see um, on the chart below a couple things just to point out. This is from a pharmacokinetic study of Epidiolex. And if you look at the Cmax, uh, there's some numbers there, 292. But I think what's most interesting is what's in parentheses, the 87.9%. That's the coefficient of variability. So this is a drug that has a very large variability within subjects or between subjects uh, when a dose is taken. And then the area under the curve, which is essentially how much gets absorbed over a period of time, again, the coefficient of variability approaches 
and this is much higher uh, than what's seen in most drugs. And on the right, you see the point I was talking about in the fasted versus the high fat meal state, uh, much higher absorption and blood levels after taking CBD or Epidiolex with a high fat meal. So I'm going to turn now to the studies with Epidiolex in treatment resistant to epilepsy. And the first one was a large open label study that Dr. Rich mentioned briefly. Uh, we didn't have a placebo group. This was really our opportunity to give this to patients, get an idea about dosing, get an idea about safety and side effects, get an idea about efficacy. And the bottom line, the signal was really quite good. Nearly 50% of individuals had a significant or more than 50%, but overall there was about a 50% reduction in convulsive seizures. What we didn't know was what's the placebo response. And so we knew that we needed to do randomized controlled trials to answer that question. We did some other studies and Evan Rosenberg was the lead author here. Uh, we looked at patients who were in this open label study at NYU and looked at some of the parameters for quality of life. And we found that there were significant improvements in quality of life for many of these children and young adults. And that for many, some of the quality of life improvements extended beyond seizure control. So likely CBD may have exerted some positive effects on anxiety, mood, or sleep uh, that were manifested in improved quality of life. And of course, the seizure control as well. We also early on looked at other disorders. Uh, Elizabeth Thiel was a leader in looking at tuber sclerosis complex. Uh, others at CHOP looked at uh, fires, which is a fever, uh, associated uh, refractory epilepsy syndrome in children. Uh, we also looked at CDKL5 deficiency disorder, ACARDI syndrome, DUP15Q and DU syndrome. So a number of these studies were done initially as open label studies and all showed a nice signal that Epidiolex was effective for many of these children and young adults in reducing their seizure activity. And this gives uh, an example of the percentage with a greater than 50% reduction in convulsive seizures across some of these genetic epilepsies um, at week 12 and at week 48. So again, week 48, we're almost a year into treatment. And you can see many of the groups uh, had participants at least 40% uh, and some over 50% with a 50% or greater reduction in seizures. So again, for an open label experience, this is, this is good data. This is very encouraging uh, for a company that to say it's worthwhile doing a randomized controlled trial and getting the hard scientific data. And so we did that. We first did it in Drave syndrome. This was published in the New England Journal about three years ago. It was a phase three trial of Epidiolex uh, in children two to 18 years of age with Drave syndrome. We compared placebo to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day of CBD divided twice daily. The median age of the participants was 10 years. These children had very high seizure counts, an average of 13 per month, uh, which for people on three drugs at the time is, is a lot. Um, there were serious adverse effects in 10 of the epidiolex treated patients versus three of the controls, and eight discontinued because of side effects in the epidiolex group, one due to placebo. Uh, but the really important take-home message from this study was that the Epidiolex was substantially better at reducing convulsive seizures at a 0.01 significance level uh, when compared to a placebo group. And this was a critical study in getting the FDA to approve this for Drave syndrome. There were two additional studies done uh, at the time of FDA approval, and these looked at CBD Epidiolex in lennox gastaut syndrome. And what you can see on the left side is a study led by Elizabeth Thiel published in Lancet that showed, again, a very statistically robust difference. This was a very similar design to the Drave study I just told you about, 20 milligrams per kilogram per day. And then on the right, we did a dose ranging study that I led between 10 and 20 milligrams per kilogram per day of Epidiolex compared to placebo. And again, very nice statistically significant results, which led to the FDA approval. And what, one important point on the dosing is that the 20 was a bit better than the 10 milligram per kilogram per day dose, but only a little bit, and it really bought more side effects. So I think the consensus of people involved was that the 10 milligrams per kilogram per day was really a better target dose than the 20. And then finally, in tuberous sclerosis compact, 
complex. This is a large study, again, led by Elizabeth Thiel. There were 224 patients. It reduced seizures uh, significantly in the two groups. These were high-dose groups, 25 and 50 milligrams per kilogram per day, so substantially improved reduction in seizures compared to placebo. Um, but again, adverse effects were common and not surprisingly more so in the higher dose group. So with these results, Epidiolex was FDA approved um, initially uh, for lennox gastel and Dravet syndrome, starting at 2.5 milligrams per kilogram per day, twice split twice daily, uh, and then escalating up to five uh, with a maximum dose typically of 10 milligrams per kilogram twice daily, uh, which would be a total of 20. Uh, but most of us try to stop at 10 or even lower sometimes and see how people do. And similar for tuberous sclerosis, but the maximum dose going up to 25 milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, and again, very nice to see these results leading to FDA approval for these three different indications. Let's turn now to some of the safety results from these trials. One of the things that we need to do, there are the potential for liver function test abnormalities, so we recommend testing them at baseline before the epidiolex is started, and then after one month, three months, and then every six months thereafter, because epidiolex can raise AST and ALT. Um, in two-thirds of the cases, uh, discontinuation or reduction of epidiolex resolve these transaminase elevations. And in one-third of cases, the elevations resolve with no dose reduction. So it's often transient. And the dose adjustment recommended uh, is there for patients with moderate or severe hepatic involvement. So obviously, if individuals start on epidiolex who have known liver disease, we go with lower doses and increase the dose more slowly. Other issues that do occur with epidiolex, the potential for weight loss, uh, it has been associated with decrease in hematocrit and hemoglobin. This has rarely been clinically significant, but something to just be aware of. And it can also cause elevations in, in serum creatinine. Again, it's been pretty infrequent and pretty mild when this has occurred. For the adverse effects in the randomized controlled trials, things that were seen in the epidiolex treated patients uh, versus placebo at rates of 10% or greater, uh, ce central nervous system ones were mainly somnolence or tiredness, some insomnia, some poor quality sleep. GI side effects are among the most common, decreased appetite, diarrhea, and vomiting, especially the latter two at high doses. Elevated transaminases, again related to high doses, and often co-treatment with valproic acid. Dermatologic side effects like rash are infrequent, but they can occur. And then there are infections, which are more frequent in the epidiolex group and some systemic side effects, such as malaise, asthenia, and pyrexia. And some of the study withdrawals were related mainly to elevations in transaminases and somnolence. With regards to the serious adverse effects, ones that were thought to be treatment uh, associated, the elevated transaminases were probably the major one that we discussed at the FDA meeting and that led to concern and we were able to identify risk factors for these elevated liver function tests. And the most important was valproate cotherapy and high epidiolex dose and elevated transaminases before the individual started on epidiolex. And the transaminases that tend to be affected are ALT more than AST. So in conclusion, just looking over cannabis therapies, uh, CBD and THC have shown efficacy in preclinical animal models of different seizures and epilepsy models. CBD reduces convulsive and drop seizures in Dravet syndrome, lennox gastaut syndrome, and tuberous sclerosis syndromes. There's no evidence that CBD or CBDV are effective for focal epilepsy at this time other than focal seizures occurring in individuals with TSC. We need data on other epilepsies, genetic generalized epilepsies and these other rare epilepsies that I mentioned. Uh, there are positive signals in some of these cases, but we need randomized trials to get the science and find out the true answer. We need safety and efficacy data on THC. As Dr. Rich said, many states, it's available for patients. There's a lot of religion in my view about uh, the efficacy of THC in treating human epilepsy. We have zero controlled 
controlled trial data, and we have really zero good safety data in children with epilepsy. Uh, we certainly have safety data in adolescents who use it recreationally, and we know there are negative effects on the brain and behavior from THC, so something to be aware of. And we need a lot more data on the lay consumption of CBD and THC through the uh, states that have medically approved cannabis and others where parents are just getting it through the internet or other places. Um, so for example, pregnancy and young children would be two populations where I think we desperately need data and it should be used with great caution and ideally with a physician's input and monitoring. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Rich. Thank you, Dr. Javinsky. It's uh, very clear you have a lot of uh, compassion for your patients and uh, it's great to hear from an expert in this area. So uh, with this, I wanna talk uh, more about the regulatory landscape and kind of some differentiation. So as I mentioned earlier, um, this, is, this slide's uh, very critical to understand the differences between the FDA approved product, Epidiolex, and non-prescription CBD products. So first off, we have the source. So for the Epidiolex product, this is derived from cannabis and uh, the Sativex uh, product. And it is in a, grown in a very, very highly controlled environment, uh, controlled light, water, soil, and um, it has, uh, it's tested in no contaminants. For non-CBD products, they're, um, these are the over-the-counter products that are derived from the hemp plant. And um, we really don't have any standards whatsoever for quality, consistency, and the regulations do vary by state. The CBD content, content in the Epidiolex product is standardized. And I'll show you on the next slide that there's various studies that have shown vastly different levels of uh, CBD and the non-CBD products as well as THC content. In the um, Epidiolex product, the THC content is regulated at less than 0.3%. It does vary in the over-the-counter CBD products. And uh, Epidiolex is FDA approved, CBD products are not. Um, typically, we're seeing coverage by most plans. Um, interestingly, when you look at prior authorization, um, a lot of the very, um, the less often used, I would say, anti-epilepsy drugs are relatively high on the price continuum, um, as is Epidiolex, uh, but, um, and that leads us to prior authorization. And I do want to um, talk to Dr. Davinsky as we get into the Q&A about, from his perspective, on working these patients up, because I think that's an important um, consideration for managed care. There's no coverage for non-CBD products. I've never found a health plan that does cover them. And um, this federal for forfeiture I'll talk about in just a minute. So this was a study that, uh, that looked at, a number of studies here, that looked at samples from dispensaries in randomized uh, cities on the West Coast. Seems like uh, when you go to California, you go to Colorado, you see a little bit more availability of the product. So 75 edible products of different brands of CBD. And you can see here the THC content, when labeled, 17% and only 17% was accurate. 23% was underlabeled and 60% was overlabeled. So certainly a concern for the amount of THC in the product and um, only 30% of those products even had content information on the label. None of those with CBD uh, were accurate. 31% were underlabeled in the CBD amount, 69% were overlabeled. So clearly we see a lot of variation from lot to lot with CBD that we can go into a dispensary and buy. So there's no approved medical use today under DEA scheduling for marijuana or CBD. They're both considered a category one controlled substance. And um, the FDA though has approved some synthetic THC analogs. We've got some C2 and C3 products here for chemotherapy, nausea and vomiting, anorexia, weight loss. You can see that on the slide yourself. Interesting, Epidiolex when it came out was a C5 product. Uh, the DEA decided to make it a C5 controlled substance. And as of April 16th of this year, they have removed that scheduling from the product. And it is approved for, as Dr. Davinsky mentioned, LGS, DS, and TSC. So interestingly, what does that mean now that Epidiolex is non-controlled any longer? Well, if you have a state with a drug monitoring program, that database no longer has to be checked. 
before you're prescribing or dispensing Epidiolex. Prescriptions are now good for up to a year under the Controlled Substance Act. Any controlled substance is only good for up to five refills in six months. So now those prescriptions should be good for up to a year based on the State Pharmacy Practice Act. Most State Pharmacy Practice Acts allow a prescription non-controlled to be good for up to a year, up to the number of refills authorized. Uh, this may allow for some off-label use, although we'll probably still see some control over that off-label use by payers. And this now only affects Epidiolex, not the other cannabinoids or CBD products. So they're still considered federally a Schedule I controlled substance. Um, although states are allowing them to be sold, uh, there have been some uh, cases where CBD products uh, at TSA checkpoints have been found in patients' uh, carry-on luggage and have been um, taken from those patients. Uh, take it from those those people, and um, I don't know if there's been any prosecution of those those people for violating the Federal Controlled Substance Act. However, it is something that's out there, and um, also uh, when Epidiolex was descheduled, it uh, was now approved for patients one year of age and older. So the FDA considerations. The FDA has not given us a clear regulatory framework for CBD products other than Epidiolex. Um, these other products, as I said, differ in composition. Uh, they've not really been studied. Uh, Epidiolex went through the clinical trials. Uh, Dr. Davinsky was part of those, uh, clearly, and uh, has shown its efficacy. And uh, the attempts to market these products, the CBD products, as dietary supplements which don't require FDA approval are running a follow the agency. I'll share that with you in an upcoming slide here. Um, they're excluded from dietary supplement definition. Um, I do differ a little bit in the slide. The, the reference said the FDA is working quickly to establish potential pathways for marketing CBD. Um, I don't see that happening very quickly, but maybe from FDA terminology, it's quickly. But uh, consumers have to be aware of this. There's a lot of unsubstantiated claims out there, and there's been a series of warning letters that have been sent to manufacturers. So, oops, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way here. Uh, recent FDA actions. Uh, the FDA has been very active in this, uh, this category, looking at illegal marketing of CBD products. In 2020, so far, 11 companies received warning letters to remove the claims that their uh, CBD products can mitigate, prevent, treat, diagnose, or cure COVID-19. So clearly that's something that's on everybody's mind right now as the pandemic continues. Over 20 companies received warning letters last year regarding illegally marketed CBD products as medicines. And uh, Cureleaf, which is a product that, uh, or is a company that has a number of CBD products marketed um, has received, uh, in, the, in the past, received FDA uh, sanctions and letters asking them to give 15 days to respond. Some of the statements are shown here that they used within their marketing materials on the different uh, diseases that it could be treated. Uh, it could be used with, uh, with opioids uh, to lessen the buildup of tolerance. Some of these statements were clearly criticized by the FDA and clearly received a warning letter from them and had to respond back to them. And I believe all of these uh, various statements have been removed from any of their marketing materials at this point in time. So when you look at formulary management and benefit design for uh, these products, uh, interestingly, because the CBD and medical marijuana are still considered a C1, with the exception of Epidiolex, which is available and FDA approved, if you're, um, you, if you're a Medicare or Medicaid plan, you must not cover medical marijuana or CBD products because they are a class one controlled substance and not allowed for dispensing. So Epidiolex is exempt from that and that certainly can be covered, but the medical marijuana and CBD, if you're Medicare or Medicaid, cannot be covered. Um, Epidiolex usually is covered with some type of prior authorization or requirements for step therapy approach. Um, why is that? It's a relative high cost product. It would prevent the off-label use of the product at this point until we have data to support that. It assures that other therapies, perhaps less expensive therapies, hopefully efficacious therapies are utilized first. And um, the thing that I'm finding, even I went trying to find out with the new approval for Epidiolex, uh, 
um, with uh, TSC, I didn't find any prior authorization criteria currently out there that had been updated and published at least online that showed that TSC was an available indication for epidiolex. So I think as payers, we have a responsibility to keep on top of this. And as these products get new indications to make sure that we update our prior authorization criteria to cover those particular new indications. I've gotten a lot of questions in the past about hospital formularies, um, medical marijuana. Some patients wanna bring their medical marijuana into the hospital. Uh, clearly, if it's smoked, it uh, should be against the fire marshal regulations and, uh, and hospital regulations, so that typically is not allowed. And if you allow the patient to bring in their own uh, medical marijuana or CBD, non-approved, FDA-approved CBD, uh, you can risk some federal funding because of that C1 status. So it is something to be aware of. Uh, distribution of the product, initially when the product came available, there were um, a small number of specialty pharmacies that were allowed to dispense the product. I think there were a few reasons for that. Number one, keeping control of inventory levels, and number two, making sure that the patients were adequately counseled on using the product correctly. Uh, since Epidiolex was launched, there's more than 15,000 patients that have received it. Uh, the specialty pharmacies are listed here, but the manufacturer has recognized the fact that there's a lot of outpatient hospital outpatient pharmacies that treat these um, patients with uh, these seizures and has made it available in um, some additional hospital outpatient pharmacies at this point. And I would suspect that we would probably see additional distribution channels in the future as we learn more and more about the product. Provider and patient education. It's very important that when the product is dispensed, that it's dispensed in its original container and we use the adapter and oral dosing syringes that are provided with it. We should wash and dry the syringe between uses, otherwise the, the solution may turn cloudy. That doesn't necessarily affect its efficacy, but people will question that. Uh, it should be stored at room temperature and not be frozen. And very importantly, based on the studies that have been done, the patients need to be told to discard any unused Epidiolex solution after 12 weeks from when the bottle is first opened by the consumer. The warnings and precautions, and I'll go through these quickly because Dr. Davinsky covered most of these. The somnolence and sedation, we have to be aware of that. No hazardous machinery, driving, that type of thing. Typically, these are younger patients that will get uh, started on the product, so that may not be as big of a concern. Uh, there is some suicidal thinking and behavior. We counsel the patients about that. Uh, clearly, that's been a concern with THC products as well, So, um, but we just want to make sure we're aware of that. Uh, aware that uh, making them aware that there might be some worsening of uh, depression syndromes, uh, suicidal thoughts, behaviors, and then the liver enzymes uh, Dr. Davinsky covered as well. So we need to make sure the patient's aware of that and understand what the signs and symptoms of that can be. Uh, if we do have the patient that gets some adverse events uh, with the product and we need to discontinue it, it has to be done a, on a slow basis, uh, slow withdrawal, so we don't put the patient into some more seizure activity, uh, very, very uh, slow withdrawal. And uh, there is a pregnancy reg registry for females with Epidiolex, and uh, they should be registered in that. So if they do become pregnant, uh, we need to make sure that uh, the healthcare provider is, uh, first off, goes over the fact that uh, we should try and avoid pregnancy if we can, but if they do become pregnant, make sure the healthcare provider is aware of that. And, um, it is important to note that if the patient is drug tested, it is possible that they may have a positive cannabis drug screen, even with the small levels of THC in the Epidiolex product, so they need to be made aware of that. Drug-drug interactions, uh, Epidiolex, uh, and there's many more drug interactions that are covered in the package insert, so I just wanna hit some highlights here, but it is metabolized by cytochrome P453A4 and cytochrome P452C19, so if you co-administer it with strong inhibitors of those enzymes, uh, such as diltiazem, verapamil, ketoconazole, et cetera, uh, you will increase the Epidiolex concentration. Also the 2C9, 2C19 inhibitors, flu, uh, fluoxamine, uh, esoniazid, and uh, ritonavir. Uh, 
If you co-administer it with inducers, you may decrease epidiolex concentrations, and you can see the 3A4 inducers here and the 2C19 inducers. These are just some of those products. Probably more importantly to us, with other anti-epilepsy drugs, there are some interactions. So if you're using epidiolex with uh, clobazem, uh, there's a potential threefold increase in plasma concentration of the metabolites of uh, clobazem. With uh, valproate, we uh, may see an increase in the incidence of liver enzyme elevation, as was mentioned earlier. And uh, with the other products here on the last uh, bullet point, uh, some increased serum concentrations of some of those products are possible as well when they're used in combination with epidiolex. So being aware of those, and I think we've got, uh, I saw a few questions coming in on that as well. So we'll ask Dr. Davinsky for his take on that in a few minutes. So with that, we're gonna move into a case-based discussion. And Dr. Davinsky, I'd ask you to take us through this if you can, and then we can have some discussion about that. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Rich. So the first case is actually someone who is in the tuber sclerosis Epidiolex trial here at NYU, a 16-year-old child with this disorder. She's a sophomore in high school um, and was struggling because of seizures. She was having two focal unaware seizures every week and an average of one nocturnal convulsion every month. She had previously been on oxcarbazepines, anisamide, and a modified Atkins diet. And at the time of enrollment in the trial, she was on eslicarbazepine, 1600 a day, by gabitrin, 3,000 milligrams a day, and levetiracetam, 3,000 milligrams per day. So again, big doses. This is a 16-year-old. Um, I wouldn't want to be on any one of these meds at these doses, never mind all three. And this is her MRI scan, which shows the tuber there in the, uh, it's the left side of the image, but it is actually the right frontal lobe. So that uh, bright spot on the screen on the left upper corner of the MRI scan is a, indicates the presence of a tuber, uh, and those are often the places where seizures may begin. So she entered the trial two years later. Uh, she was a freshman at university on Epidiolex from a specialty pharmacy after it got FDA approved. Um, so she's now on four medications, and since she is doing better, we're planning on pulling back one of the other medications. Currently, she has a focal aware seizure once a month. So again, much milder than a focal unaware, focal aware seizure. I could be having one now. My pinky can be tingling, but I'm able to talk, be coherent, be responding. I could drive a car safely, operate machinery, things like that. Focal unaware seizures where I'd be confused or non-responsive and which were occurring pretty frequently before the trial um, are gone at this time. And secondarily, generalized tonic-clonic seizures also gone. So really... A very nice response. This uh, individual continues to be on Epidiolex because they've had such a good response. And when you see this, it's really one of the more heartening things we can do as physicians is try medicine in someone who really hasn't had a decent opportunity of, of some seizure freedom and not 100% seizure freedom, but a really dramatic reduction in the seizures that were disabling to her. So some of the issues in this case that I think are worth discussing is dose initiation and adjustment. And for this case, we also started the 2.5 milligrams per kilogram per day and gradually increased weekly up towards the target dose of 25 milligrams per kilogram per day split twice daily. So 12 and a half in the morning, 12 and a half in the evening. And we went over with this patient and her family before the trial started um, how to count the seizures, what the potential side effects of the medication would be, how to think about them, um, and then the process of getting the authorization. Uh, sometimes if people are not aware of this, they wait till Friday at four o'clock and say, I got one pill left, or I got no pills left. Uh, and this is, you know, any of the specialty pharmacy drugs are not ideal for that. So we want them to know, monitor it, try to give us at least a week before you are running low or running out of medication. Um, we do need to work through insurance companies to make sure it is approved, and that requires our staff sometimes having to make phone calls, although the company can help as well. Uh, there is a patient assistance program for those who can't afford the medication um, and can show that indeed the combined family income is low. They likely will benefit for assistance programs to help them pay for the medication. And then finally, there is the potential for drug interactions. 
Dr. Rich summarized the most important one in clinical epilepsy, and that is a substantial elevation, sometimes three or four hundred percent, in the endesmethylclobazam metabolite. So that's a biologically active metabolite, so it can possibly lead to better seizure control, possibly lead to more side effects when it's elevated. I got a couple questions, if I can, for you, Oren, on, on the, uh, the case discussion. So this patient was on a clinical trial, and then they were transitioned over to a, um, approved product once the product was approved, I assume, correct? Exactly. Okay. Did you find um, difficulty in getting the patient to get approved once the product uh, um, was, our, was, was approved for this indication, or was that something that you just had to talk about the fact they were on clinical trials and then moved over to um, the currently commercially available product? Yeah, for this patient and really all the patients who are in our trial, we've been very fortunate. The insurance companies, I think, have been very overall gracious and pretty rapid in getting patients approved. So it was pretty smooth and easy for this patient and the vast majority of our patients. Okay, great. And um, th there was a question that came in. I may as well ask it here because I think it's germane to this uh, to this question uh, or to this uh, case. Um, when you when you're working these patients up uh, and looking at first line treatments and where do, where does Epidiolex fall within the continuum of these patients? Um, which drugs are you going to potentially try first, and then will you decrease some of those or DC some of those in order to? initiate epidiolex. Can you just kind of talk about that from your clinical experience? Yeah, no, it's a great question. What we know for sure is that epidiolex clearly is effective as an adjunctive therapy for the three disorders, Dravé, Lennox-Gesto, and tuberous sclerosis syndromes. Uh, no one can really say for any of those syndromes, what's the best drug? What's the treatment of choice? There are no head-to-head -head comparisons. For example, Dravé syndrome, uh, the two other commonly used medications, valproic acid and clobazam, are out there. There have recently been other approved drugs, uh, steripental and fenfluramine got approved, but we have no head-to-head -head comparisons for any of these drugs in Dravet syndrome and, quite frankly, for the other two syndromes as well. So people can have opinions or views. I think this drug's more effective. I think that drug's more effective, uh, but we just don't have scientific data. So the question comes in, you have a patient with Dravé or lennox Gasto who has their first seizure and you make their diagnosis, oh, this is a classic history of Dravé, uh, clinically you meet criteria, we'll get the gene testing, but right now the child meets criteria, what drug do you choose? Uh, and that's really a matter of, of physician preference at this time. There's just no absolute, you can get experts together and say, well, I would start with Valproate, I would start with Clobazam, I'd start with both, I'd start with Epidiolex. Uh, there really, there's just no data to drive this. And I think as happens in medicine, the more that physicians use medications like Epidiolex, the more they get comfortable with it, those drugs tend to move up towards the first line or the second drug tried for a disorder. Um, and what's fascinating in this modern world we're living in is many parents are extremely attracted to the idea of cannabidiol and Epidiolex because it's a natural product, because this is something made by nature, albeit processed by man, uh, whereas most of the other drugs to treat epilepsy are not plant-derived, and they are made in chemical drug company warehouse, you know, factories. Uh, and so I think there's something attractive to families about giving their child a natural product. So it's not uncommon. Uh, patients with these three syndromes, and in my practice, patients without these, which we really have no solid data, are asking sometimes as the first line to have epidiolex. And I think, I think certainly for these three disorders, it's a reasonable possibility. I think for other ones, I, I wouldn't recommend that at this time. Okay, great. So uh, at this point in time, we've had a number of excellent questions that have come in, and uh, I'll kind of uh, parse those out to the two of us. So uh, the first question, um, Oren, that uh, came off is um, or came came into us was, um, our, uh, you, you mentioned it briefly in the last section about kind of off-label uses here. Um, are you doing any clinical trials at this point in time for any other seizure act, uh, seizure treatments with Epidiolex? Um, are you having any success with any of those? And are you finding that you're getting any coverage for other types of uh, seizures. Yeah, no, 
Great questions. I'm involved in a CBDV trial with GW Pharmaceuticals uh, for autism, actually. Um, I'm not doing any CBD trials as of the current moment. I think there's a need to study uh, Epidiolex for other epilepsies. I have used it off-label. In the open-label, the original Lancet Neurology study of the 214 people that uh, we mentioned before, we had people with focal epilepsies in that study. We had people with some other rare genetic epilepsies. We had people with generalized epilepsies. You know, we certainly have seen positive signals in many of those other disorders, but, and we have used it, certainly if I have someone uh, with an epilepsy that has not been controlled with some of the better medications for their disorder, a lot of those patients want to be tried if they don't have one of the three approved syndromes uh, to be treated with Epidiolex. And the approval process for those really varies by the insurance company. Uh, some have been remarkably lenient and generous and approved it, and some have really uh, held a line occasionally even for the approved disorders, but uh, certainly for the non-approved ones, some companies have said no. So we haven't been able to get it approved for everybody. I certainly do use it off-label for epilepsies uh, when I think it has a chance to help people and they've been through the major treatments for that disorder without good success. So I think that's where we stand right now. And I think more studies will be coming in the future from other investigators. Okay, great. Uh, another question came in about tapering of a uh, patient off of Epidiolex if you need to. Can you just take us through how, how that would work in your clinical practice? So, you know, the, the data varies, but I think right now it doesn't appear to be a great risk to stop it relatively quickly. But, you know, out of prudence, no one wants to recommend uh, sudden discontinuation. Certainly for anyone with epilepsy, if they get a severe rash, which is very uncommon with Epidiolex, uh, typically, we would stop it suddenly. If you think that patient is someone who's really been fragile and prone towards status with medication withdrawal, um, they could potentially be admitted, you know, but again, I've not had to do that in treating probably over 300 people with Epidiolex, but you never know what can happen on rare occasions. In general, if someone has been on it and they're just, you know, tired, having GI discomfort, their liver enzymes are going up and they're not really coming down, uh, and it's a decision that the efficacy hasn't been that great and we want to get them off the medication, I would typically taper them off over two to four weeks uh, would be a typical thing, cutting the dose, let's say 25% per week for four weeks or so. You know, that would be a standard one. I've certainly done it much faster and on occasion I've, I've done it slower. It really a lot depends on the individual patient, why it's being discontinued, what other drugs are present and how well protected they are and how severe their epilepsy is. Okay, all right, great. All right, uh, there's some uh, side effect questions that came up. Um, a number of them about GI toxicity, and um, kind of want to find out from your perspective, how do you manage GI toxicity in these patients when you do see it? And one of the comments that came in, or one of the questions was, um, a, some of the prescribers it seems to be maybe going from BID to TID to reduce GI side effects, uh, any, uh, granted that is off-label, but it's labeled for BID, so I want to make sure that we're aware of that. But um, are you seeing any of that being done? And just kind of general comments about GI side effects. Sure. So GI side effects are probably, you know, one of the major ones that lead to discontinuation uh, for some patients because it can cause nausea, diarrhea, decreased appetite, and weight loss. Uh, and when they're problematic, I think either giving the Epidiolex with food can sometimes be helpful. Otherwise, if it's taken on empty stomach and there are GI side effects, it could, it could affect the GI system more. Um, sometimes lowering the total dose, I think for some individuals, very high doses like 20, 25, 30 milligrams per kilogram per day, which I've certainly pushed, pushed it to those doses and, and well beyond in some patients, but that's where you're typically gonna see more GI side effects. So lowering the doses, I've also done what that questioner suggested. I've split it into three times a day dosing. A lot of these patients do have severe epilepsy and they're already taking other seizure medications three or even four times a day. Uh, so it's relatively easy for the parents to just split it more frequently because the patient's already getting more frequent dosing. Um, and then occasionally, uh, if dose reduction or dose splitting doesn't work, um, I've also tried some antacids or caraphate coats the stomach lining, which has been helpful in some cases where it's really been a very effective drug. Uh, 
and in the unusual case where the GI side effects are really troublesome and splitting the dose or lowering the dose hasn't led to a resolution of the GI problems. Great. And I think the point too is uh, for the pharmacist out there to, to make sure that they add this to the patient's medication record, even if they've not dispensed it, and ask those questions too and see if they can be helpful with any recommendations. There were a number of questions that came in about the uh, liver functions and all that, but I think you covered that pretty well in, in your slides. Do you have any other comments to make on that? No, I think you know we should monitor liver functions and the big risk factors are baseline elevations, co-therapy with valproate, and high dose therapy. But again, the vast majority of people, you know, valproate is used in a lot of individuals, certainly with Dravet and Lennox Gasto, and somewhat with tuber sclerosis. And there's no reason you cannot use Epidiolex with valproate. The vast majority of individuals tolerate it quite well. Uh, but those who are on high dose valproate and high dose Epidiolex who have baseline elevations, you know, those are the ones to really watch carefully. And if you could either reduce the valproate dose or the Epidiolex dose, if liver function problems emerge, typically they will resolve. It's interesting because one of the questions that came in um, talked about seeing doses above 20 milligrams per kilogram per day and also seeing discontinuation of valproic acid prior to or when starting Epidiolex. So I think you've kind of addressed that. I think it, it perhaps maybe is uh, somebody that uh, is not treating these patients as frequently as you are. Um, or maybe that's just their comfort level and looking at, uh, at doing that. But clearly we want to make sure that these patients don't start having seizure activity uh, by doing a premature discontinuation of something they might be controlled, help to be controlled. Absolutely. And the only other thing I'll add to that, because it's, it's not on liver specifically, but it's on the interactions and co-medication, is the point you made about clobazam. And since we know that the endesmethyl metabolite is biologically active, it may contribute to seizure control. It almost certainly contributes to somnolence and other side effects. That if someone is on clobazam, especially if they're on higher doses of clobazam, uh, you should really think about reducing that uh, either empirically or follow blood levels of both the clobazam and its metabolite, which can be ordered, uh, I think, through LabCorp and maybe some other ones. But monitoring those is going to be important because if you add Epidiolex to someone on clobazam and they become more tired, the tiredness actually may have nothing to do with the epidiolex. It may be completely driven by epidiolex's effect on the clobazam metabolite. Okay, great. And we, I talked about uh, some of the restriction on distribution, but have you seen any restrictions on prescribers? I mean, from your perspective, obviously you're a specialist in this. You, is it pretty much generally open to all prescribers? Uh, will the patient having this many seizures and being in pediatric be going to a specialist predominantly? Yeah, I think the child. vast majority of these children, by, you know, they're all treatment resistant. Um, a lot of these kids had been on six to 10 drugs before they went in the trial. The average number in all these trials are on three medications before Epidiolex was added to the mix. So this is a pretty re refractory and treatment resistant population. And the vast majority, I would say, of this population are treated by pediatric or adult epilepsy specialists. So um, it, for us, it's been no problem overall getting the medication. But I think even for a general neurologist or other physician, uh, if a patient meets the criteria, it should be a relatively straightforward procedure once you are aware of who the specialty pharmacy is uh, and going through the approval process. But it's, it's been pretty straightforward. Okay. All right, great. Yeah, there were a number of questions that came in about uh, the prior authorization and uh, major barriers to access. I think if this was a year ago, a year and a half ago, we might have had more barriers to access, but I think people are pretty comfortable now. And um, I, I, the folks I've talked to, I'm not seeing a, a lot of prior authorizations denied any longer. I'm also not seeing a lot of uh, requirements for X drug to be used prior to using Epidiolex. I think that's being left to the prescriber at this point to make those determinations. Yep. So um, there was a, a question here about the, uh, the discarding after 12 weeks and how strict is that? And that is in the package insert. And I think the major thing we want to make sure of is that the product maintains its potency. And we've only can make sure of that by discarding it after 12 weeks. Uh, and I think that is a concern if, 
somebody, and that's the other thing with specialty pharmacy where they tend to dispense it just kind of when you need it. You said, don't wait till four o'clock Friday. That's a great point, but they'll get it to the patient when they need the next bottle and not leave it there because if they accidentally open it, now that 12 week period starts and we certainly would hate to throw away something as expensive as this to, because somebody opened up a second bottle and they didn't need it yet. Exactly. Yep. So with that, I uh, wish everybody a good uh, conference and I uh, hope everybody stays safe, stay socially distanced, wear your masks, and uh, we thank you for your attention. This activity has been jointly provided by Purdue University College of Pharmacy and PVI, Peer Review Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash RGT 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Greenwich Biosciences Incorporated.